Cool, so thanks for joining us. We're gonna make a start now. Um, a quick checklist first. If you're not speaking, please have your mic on mute this evening so we can limit the background noise. If your camera is on, be aware that the event is being recorded. We record these events so that those who are unavailable can um, this evening can join us at a later day. To thank our sponsors, this webinar is being funded by The Hive, a support program for co-ops delivered by Co-ops UK in partnership with the Co-op Bank. Um, like I've just said, we'll share some more information about how to apply in a follow-up email. I mentioned the new economy program too, which is our democratic learning and action platform now in its third year. And you can take a look at the individual courses that we're offering there. The program started in mid-September and runs until March, 2021. And you can see that at stirtoaction.com forward slash workshops. So on to this evening's event. To go back to the event description for tonight, the rise of anti-racist and Black Lives Matter movements, particularly in 2020, is demanding all of us to review racial and economic inequality in the UK. While estimates suggest that Bain co-ops only constitute one to 2% of the UK's co-op movement, and it is an estimate, we don't actually have any specific data. There's a responsibility to remake the connection between co-ops and racial justice. Um, in terms of kind of personally with our work at Stir to Action, since meeting Jessica Gordon Nemhard back in 2015, um, Jessica's the Professor of Community Justice and Social Economic Development in the Department of Africana Studies at John Jay College in New York, and also the author of Collective Courage, which is a book that I can't recommend enough. Um, and then later meeting people like Mary Bautista at the Center for Family Life in Brooklyn, New York. We've been inspired by a movement defining co-ops as a tool for anti-oppression, political agency and economic security. Last year, we were part of a consortium with Decolonizing Economics and others to bring the founders of Cooperation Jackson to the UK for a residential course and a national tour. Our recent online festival was joined by Esteban and our Beyond Here programme has been offering webinars on the worker co-op development in immigrant communities in co-ops and black economics. So tonight's event is, a, is an acknowledgement of all the current and historical work of BAME-led co-ops, um, and also an opportunity to see how the UK co-op movement can support more of this work over the next few years. To introduce the panel, I'm excited to say that we're joined in this order by Carolina Rodriguez from the Essential Workers Cooperative, a migrant-led group of cleaners, part of the Cleaners and Allied Independent Workers Union, who are empowering others in London to create dignified livelihoods in the cleaning industry. We're then joined by Esteban Kelly, the Executive Director of the US Federation of Worker Co-ops and co-founder of Aorta, who will take us on a detour through their recent work and recent history of POC-led co-ops in the United States. And finally, we'll be joined by Amy Hall, the new internationalist, who will share her personal experiences of working in the co-op sector over the last few years. So thanks again for everybody joining us this evening. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Sean Wellens. Um, Sean is a longtime cooperator. He works for Calverts, which is a design agency and worker co-op in East London. And he's also a co-founder of the Solid Fund. Um, and he's been working with Carolina and the Central Workers Co-op over the last six months. So they're gonna spend the next 15 minutes talking about why they're setting up a co-op. So thanks again, over to Sean and Carolina. You're on mute, Sean. Hello. Hi, sorry about that, everybody. Hello. Um, uh, so, I uh, would like to introduce Carolina and I'm just going to um, ask her two or three questions to lead her into the themes that she has uh, volunteered to talk to us about tonight. But first of all, so Essential Workers Cooperative is a is the germ, it's a startup, it's the, we think, probably the first migrant-led worker co-op uh, in the UK. Um, so first of all, Carolina, um, would you like to just tell us about the background to your co-op idea, where it came from and the group that formed it, um, and, and some more about what you're aiming for and hoping for through this new work co-op initiative? Um, thank you, Sean. Um, thank you, Johnny, for the introduction. And I'm very, very happy to be here tonight and to share our experience and our journey so far. 
So um, I'm part of the Essential Workers Cooperative, which is an initiative that started just um, before the lockdown um, here in London. So we've been supported, uh, we, our group came from um, Kaiwu, which is the, a union established in London in 2012. Um, Kaiwu stands for um, Cleaners and Ally Independent Workers Union, which is a registered trade union representing around uh, 1,500 um, cleaner operatives. Um, and so basically, uh, at the beginning of the lockdown, and and, and that um, moment, we started to think, well, many people are losing their jobs. There are no job security at this stage. What um, what can we do about it? Yeah, so that's where the idea of setting the cooperative came from. So just um, to make sure that um, everyone has a decent job and part of our initiative also came from uh, the group discussions of um, political awareness. We acknowledge that uh, our political awareness came from uh, the idea to protect uh, our rights at work through the union, but also to um, recognize our power, our agency to change things, to challenge this, uh, this outsource system, outsourcing system. So that's um, where we came from. In, we started to have these meetings, online meetings in March and to work together on how to how to set up a the cooperative, we think is the most appropriate vehicle to advance advancing the economic justice and racial justice. Um, so obviously when you work with um with the community, you find different skills, different abilities. Um, so we realize that we need to be supported because we have the commitment to set up the cooperative, but we might not have the resources or the knowledge or the experience of how to do it. And that's uh, when we keep, um, we start contacting the Hive and the recommendation. Um, so Sean has been our pro bono consultant since then. He's been uh, supporting us in completing the application uh, to submit to the Hive. So we aim to establish our cooperative in summer 2021. Uh, our aim is, is, we are not naive about our aim, which is changing the outsource model of uh, in the cleaning industry. However, we are committed to, to do it because that will be a milestone for our Latin American community which is heavily involved in this in this industry is around 56% of our community um, are working as a cleaning operatives. One of the characteristics of our group, of our cooperative, is that all of us um, are cleaning operatives. That means that from from the inception of the of the union the eligibility to be, a, be become a member of the union is that you need to be an operative you cannot be a supervisor you cannot be a manager that means that we are working with the frontline people and yes that's like in a nutshell why we started the cooperative thank you carolina and um <clears throat> i was wondering could you Tell us a bit more about the the, the background of um, the, the Latin American community in London and the UK, um, and the patterns of migration and how you've all come here, um, and what kind of organisations? Because obviously you have this this new union, or fairly new union, but obviously a um, a history of Latin American organisations, and a bit more about the cleaning sector and employment practices, and what kind of campaigns you've been involved with be good to hear okay um well um the migration of the latin american community to the uk and particular to london 
started in the in the late 70s um, due to turmoil and political dictatorship in Chile. So the first uh, wave of migration came from Chile. And then in the 80s and 90s, many Colombians um, look for um, asyl asylum in the UK due to the political and social unrest. So there were like a two wave migration and many of those um, refugees at the beginning because they were uh, involved in politics in their countries of origin, Chile, Colombia, they also become, became quite active in the UK and in London. So organizations like Latin American Women Rights Services started another organization called Latin American House started and they've been supporting Latin Americans in London. So the migration also is, um, implies that they were in the in London as an economic, economic hub. So most of the Latin Americans are re residents in London. So around 145,000. That means that Latin Americans are the eighth um, non UK born population in London. Um, after that, recently, more recently in 2000, um, after the economic crisis in Spain, there were an, what is called the onward migration from mainland Europe into the UK. Um, one of the characteristics of our community is that despite the, they are high educated, they are um, on, on low paid jobs and the lack of English is also preventing them to gain mobility to bet, better paid jobs. So at some point that uh, prompts, um, because they're stuck in the cleaning industry at some point that prompts um, coming together and forming unions. Yeah, so there were unions union that represent Latin Americans so they start to go to the bigger, bigger unions in the UK but unfortunately that didn't represent um, the needs of the cleaners. So they started to create their own unions and Kaiwu comes from there. Um, about our, our community um, in, in working conditions, there are no very good working conditions in the cleaning sector. So the working practices are um, driven by outsourcing. So obviously outsourcing procurement of cleaning contracts is for the lowest price, putting a lot of pressure in um, the contractors and therefore in the cleaning operatives. So there's been um, a lot of, of pressure on, on, the, on the operatives and thus we think that creating the cooperative is going to tackle that model because the cleaning relies on outsourcing and that fragments um, the life of, of people really because they, they can know this um, model. So cleaning, cleaning industry lies heavily in part-time. So people need to have two or three jobs to um, make a 40 hours week of work. Yes, and many of the cleaning jobs are on, on sociable hours. And that has a uh, bad effect in people's lives. We um, this COVID nineteen also um, brought to to the surface the fact that cleaning is a essential essential job. It's an essential work, and this is where our the name of the, our cooperative came from. We is is um, Cleaning as a, as a work is undervalued. 
it's only when it goes wrong the or when it's you know you miss um the collection of the rubbish or things like that that you notice yes yeah? so cleaning really enables other industries to work and so through campaigning in kaiwu we are working to make cleaning um a, a job that is recognized as essential as essential work now that obviously making us safe a place um covid safe is uh, depends on the expertise and the work of cleaners so um as i mentioned before we are not naive about the amount of work that a cooperative um involves setting a cooperative but we also recognize that is through this um political awareness and go beyond the political awareness uh, from the union that we can respond and advance in social justice. Because um, it's not only an idea, but it's also a material conditions. And we recognize that the cooperative model being a democratic uh, way to run a business, it will have a uh, effect on how people live and enjoy and bring dignity to to their work. Thank you, Carolina. Um, I was interested. We've we've talked a bit, and maybe people would like to hear you talk about how you think um, the way you see yourselves. Um, you know, as a as a migrant group of Latin American workers, how that whether that meshes into what you understand to be the narrative of racial justice and how appropriate that is to to link that into your uh, your work and what you're doing, your plans. So we are, um, there are for me there are two vehicles of social justice yeah and economic justice and one is the ideas yeah the idea of justice that is um it um sorry i'm going to refer to my notes because i think this is this is a quite interesting question um, As I mentioned, it, um, the idea of justice is is quite interesting, but it's is also an an ex, a manifestation in the um, in the material conditions. So we thought, well, we are um, we are migrants. We recognize ourselves um, as a minority ethnic as an ethnic minority. Yeah. In in the UK in London, we from the 33, 33 boroughs in London, we are only recognizing four boroughs. That is um, has an, a good effect because that brought changes to our population, to our community, fostering inclusion to access all kind of services and political representation. But it's been a long process advancing in that recognition of our of our ethnicity yeah and it means um a lot of advocacy work coming together yeah but we think this cooperative model responds more quickly to advance in the justice because it um, brought that idea of justice into our material conditions because we are running our own business, so we can decide how to manage or how to foster and nurture our prosperity and our well-being, which is a direct manifestation of justice. So that's what we think is, is important. When you recognize uh, that you, your operations, because I was, um, you know, working 
into an empty building at 4 30 in the morning to clean it and you recognize that you you struggle to to make ends meet and that you are in a very difficult working condition potentially detrimental to your well-being and somehow you have to mourn your oppressions and to kind of check it out a bit and okay you 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 need to be aware of you or your or your agency yeah and that agency at the individual level and the collective level so there are two vehicles one is quite um the bureaucratic system you know recognition through monitoring forms pick off but it's also how we manage that awareness of power and agency so we we can we can challenge the system and then it's, it's our decision to do it and as i said it's, it's not naive we are not naive about it but this is we are determined to do it because we know that's the most effective um vehicle to advance well, thank you so much, Carolina, for, for sharing your experience. We're going to come back to an open question, um, open discussion. So if you've got any questions about Carolina's work, we will come back to that. Um, I'm going to hand over to Esteban um, from the Worker Co-op Federation in the United States. Esteban joined us at our online festival this year as part of a conversation around transatlantic cooperativism. Um, so thanks for joining us again tonight, Esteban. Over to you. Always, uh, it's a pleasure to be back with you all. So some of what I wanted to share, actually, I think I wanna caveat what, what I'm about to share, because I know um, a lot of you are probably thinking about, you know, pretty skeptically about how, how much is adaptable or how much um, is it, how useful is it to tune into um, American perspectives um, and, in order to apply them in a, in a UK context, um, especially when we're thinking about the different histories of um, racial oppression and um, movements for liberation in in the UK versus in in North America, um, and of that I would say you know a lot of a lot of what we unlocked in the US context was not so much about some innovation within the cooperative world, but actually a response or a recognition of our own grassroots movements for racial and economic justice who have been very clear for decades, including before we even formed a national federation, what it is that we need, uh, what it is that communities of color need, uh, what Black Americans need, what immigrants need, especially immigrants of color, what working people need, um, and, and what it's going to take to advance that, that agenda or to build that power. Um, and so I think the through line of what's helpful is not just entertaining stories and examples from the US, but actually, I mean, I will end by saying this, but, but kind of like give you the, the teaser right now. Um, it's just a call to tune in to what your own movements are saying. Um, you know, I'm not a grassroots organizer in the UK. <laughs> um, and certainly within the various countries of the UK, there are different communities and different movements local to your communities um, that are very clear about what it is that they need from uh, in solidarity or from allies. Um, sorry. Oh, maybe that was just an unintentional unmuted person. Um, so yeah, all to say what's what's useful is um, our stories of what it looked like to get in alignment with what grassroots movements for racial and economic justice were, were already very clearly asking for in different ways over the years. You with me so far? Great. Um, so I think one thing um, is that, it, you know, I in telling the story from the US perspective, um, and I, I, I'm saying this both as the ED for the, the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives um, and also as a, as a co-founder and core trainer within my cooperative, AORTA, which stands for 
Anti-Oppression Resource and Training Alliance, because I'm really good at making up acronyms. <laughs> um, and, uh, and also as just in the last couple of years, I was invited in as one of the advisors to the Movement for Black Lives policy table um, in, in the US. And that's the, that's the sort of organized group within Black Lives Matter, which is, you know, obviously there's autonomy and it's a kind of federated, associated, semi-autonomous movements within different states or cities or chapters around the country. But nationally, there is a, there's a table, there's a policy table um, about what actions can or, or ought to be taken um, at the city, county, state, um, or federal level. Um, and some of that relates to a little bit of like international stuff, which we don't need to get into. Anyway, they invited me in a couple years ago um, to, to be part of um, a cohort of people who organize within the social solidarity economy, um, cooperative economics to advise their work. And um, so it's, this is like, are we learning from them or lay, lay learning from us? At a certain point, we're, we're the same movements. <laughs> it's like, am I saying this in the name of BLM or in the name of the worker co-op um, uh, world or the, the movement work that I do within Aorta? I don't know, it's all, it's all the same. Um, so I would say we, it's not so much that, the, that we as an organization um, in the, the Federation or we as a broader field around uh, cooperative worker ownership um, or solidarity economics in the US pivoted to embrace an agenda around racial and economic justice. I think it's much more that those connections were already there. Our leaders were already people like myself who were leaders in inside of movements and happened to also be involved in cooperatives. Um, and it was much more of a, a recognition of that leadership and, um, and kind of a, a muting or, or shutting down the ways in which we, uh, we did a lot of self-effacing. You know, we would show up and be like, oh yeah, no, I'm with these white co-op people. So I'm not, I'm not actually gonna be real about what my politics are or the, the demonstration I'm going to on the weekend or the trainings I'm leading in the other part of my life. Um, and I think that that's not only true about racial justice, but um, like we were starting to talk about migrant justice, other um, economic justice, labor uh, campaigns, um, and, and, and even climate justice work. That it was all, all, whatever the issue is, there's all kinds of issues where, you know, it's like we would take off your name tag um, and put on your like civilian cap and now you're out in the streets marching. And it's like, what are we doing? We're the same people. If, if cooperatives and our cooperative movement is about the voice and expression and edu political education, but education and engagement of people inside of our communities. Um, how do you like that for like a subtle, I was like subtly referencing all the cooperative principles. <laughs> um, then, then centering the people part of it also means that people should be invited to show up as their full selves and doing so does a lot of work for you because you're not starting at square one. You're saying we already have people who are leaders who are sought after thinkers, theorists, consultants, facilitators, advisors, strategists, organizers in all kinds of other movements. And it means that they have the, that, that skill set that can be applied inside of the uh, the ways that we organize and educate ourselves. So, uh, you know, what it meant to invite that or recognize that was um, platforming some of that leadership. I mean, at our, certainly our conferences, other kinds of um, webinars, trainings, making sure that those very people who were already recognized as, as um, member owners or board members or other kinds of leaders inside of their cooperatives or their cooperative development organizations um, that, we weren't just inviting them to come and talk about their co-op work. We were coming them and uh, we were inviting them to come and talk about th themselves and their work comprehensively um, and to uh, go through the first kind of awkward phase of saying, listen, you've already been around this movement, uh, movement sector, whatever language you wanna use um, for, for cooperatives. What is your honest opinion about where we're failing, about where we're not doing right by our own values and politics, where we are needlessly throwing up um, hurdles or speed bumps or obstruction 
to what ought to be a pretty kind of straightforward agenda of what it looks like to show up uh, for communities of color in, in myriad ways. Um, so yeah, I mean, there there is that phase that we moved through, that awkward phase, and it's true within any given organization and certainly a network of organizations of being like, oh, are we doing this? Like, it feels different. We're talking, we're using different language. We are seeing different faces. We're, um, it's always awkward when there's a shift in power and leadership. And I think we created some positive feedback loops where um, we gave ourselves good uh, re uh, re positive reinforcement around that that adapted behavior, that when uh, when the, the presenters were a different set of people, we got good feedback, we rewarded ourselves, we made sure that they weren't tokenized and uncomfortable and alienated in the process, which then made it easier to not only invite those people back, but for, but for uh, many of our, especially our members of color, um, immigrant members of color, uh, for them to tap their friends, their coworkers, who might not have been the same people who showed up at the conferences, but certainly have been involved in their own co-op um, for years and years and to lift up their leadership. So it, it just made it easier and easier year after year. Um, and to the point where I, I think that that from the outside is the thing that starts to feel like, why did, why do these people make it look so like, what's how is this so easy? And how could that possibly be ap applicable to our context where we're so far behind? Um, it's just about spinning from a negative feedback loop to a positive one um, and recognizing that any organization or movement that is that is doing that is doing so iteratively, um, that, that power is not built overnight, uh, including if you look at the launch of Black Lives Matter uh, versus where we're at today uh, in, in 2020 um, and the kind of demonstration of power and awareness um, that that we have nowadays, uh, which especially this week I'm, I'm feeling. Um, I'm just 20 blocks from where uh, somebody in, in my community uh, was murdered by police. And that's now, I mean, it's, it's global news. I, the BBC has been covering it. The National Guard is back in my neighborhood. They were here four months ago in June during the uprisings. Um, so those are all things that I feel uh, closely connected to. Um, I think lastly, before we, I know we'll pivot to a more open conversation, I just wanted to mention a couple of things about, just more tactically about what some of the things that we did. Um, one was around membership recruitment, um, both recruitment and retention. And I think there's a lot of lip service paid to this idea of certainly diversity, um, but even to, you know the broader diversity, equity, inclusion, access, um, without adequate understanding of what what we even mean with those things. And so, you know, for example, I see in individual cooperative businesses, um, in nonprofit organizations, a an initial step, especially ones that are that have a lot of white leadership, um, an initial sort of like move toward diversity as a value and then like a, a panicking around that. And then it's like, all right, we have to scope all this work of strategy about like what it means to achieve diversity, which is already missing the point, right? Diversity is, it's just the moment of taking a glimpse in the mirror and being like, what's going on? Who's there? What kind of work do we have to do? That check might be, oh, huh, actually it turns out we're more diverse than, than, than I thought from the last time we sort of took a hard look in the mirror. But all it is is just a, a signal to you of what kind of work you have ahead of you if your leadership is not reflecting your values or is not reflecting your members or the communities that you're trying to serve. That's all it is. It is not then a goal of like, well, we're trying to get to this type of rainbow or we're trying to like stick somebody new in, you know, like a black person in such and such role so that we feel more comfortable um, without actually digging into issues of power. Um, and so I think that we, we, we did not fall into that pitfall, which was very helpful. And I think that our democratic process and structure is, is what enabled us to do that without kind of stumbling in a lot of the ways that nonprofits who don't have a cooperative membership base uh, end up stumbling. 
um, which is to say our grassroots was already really diverse, that, that there were tons of workers, even if the whole co-op was not self-identified as like, we are all people of color or we are a multiracial workplace. Um, it just turned out, if you look at who's working at Arizmendi cooperatives, bakery cooperatives that have been around for decades, it's like, oh yeah, you're like pretty successfully a multiracial business. That's cool. Um, what does it look like to lift up that leadership that you have? Um, and, um, and, and build a pipeline for leadership development. And then what does it look like to just be intentional about, oh, did we do the work of actually reaching out and making sure we were recruiting those multiracial businesses? And if so, uh, or it, yeah, if, if, if not, if those groups were not already members, what are the passively, what are some of the reasons why they might not have been? What are the signals that they were getting? Like, that's not the place for me or the culture is kind of whack. Or I went to one of the events and like, I didn't feel super comfortable. Like this seems like it's another kind of group. Um, and when the, what that, the, the, the reflection and the kinds of questions that that leads to has everything to do with um, inclusion, which again, is just like, uh, how much, how comfortable, how much are you hearing from different groups and how comfortable, how much work needs to go into hearing from women just because men are talking over them or interrupting them or uh, too many of them are on the board and it's just disproportionate, right? So that's, I think, again, it's just, it, that's an assessment moment and not necessarily a, a strategy, although there's a little more space for strategy. Um, which then brings you to equity, which is just a, an, a, um, a, a visibilization or a mapping and assessment of power and how it's flowing and operating. The power to shape things, the power to speak, um, the power to mobilize folks, the power to represent or to define what, uh, what are the terms or the priorities in representation. Um, and, and I think that it's pretty easy to map all of those things onto the cooperative principles um, or particular cooperative principles, you know, er education, training, or, uh, and orientation, open membership, uh, concern for community. Um, it, it's, I think there's a lot of, there's like a, there's a built in roadmap that can be mapped into either your governance stuff like cooperative principles or your operations and your, your, your work planning and your, your business plan. Um, lastly, I think the development field uh, was really important. Um, I talked about this uh, at the festival last month, but uh, we also recognize that co-ops beget co-ops. And so if you're starting with a core group of cooperative businesses that are um, all owning class or that are mostly white or that are all English speaking or that are all um, native born, then that's who is going to see themselves. That's who is going to be uh, culturally uh, equipped to mentor the up and coming cooperatives um, or to advise startups. And that's its own kind of cycle. So I think what we did was we intentionally invested not in just saying, oh my God, we should just like do a bunch of outreach to black and brown communities and like see if co-ops come out of it. Because starting or developing incubating a cooperative business is a really onerous process and doesn't come from just like tweeting a bunch uh, uh, to black Twitter. <laughs> it, it comes from like really um, intentional partnerships. And so what we did was we didn't say cooperatives are the solution to everything in the world. So people of color should be using co-ops. We went and found groups who had identified problems or issues that they were um, lifting up. So that might've been about employment or stable jobs or income uh, or food security for immigrant communities or black and brown communities. Who are the community-based organizations who care about that stuff, who already have networks, who already have structures and institutions, what are they doing there? And how do we introduce ourselves there um, and our model there so that they can build out a cooperative program and that one, add that in the process of doing so and inviting them into our space to tap into our technical assistance, our conferences, our resources, they're not feeling alienated. So it meant that we had to adapt. We had to practice language justice. We had to invest in having interpretation, um, at least in a couple of languages, um, and making sure that there were leaders who were multilingual or bilingual um, in order to sort of coach or mentor or to provide technical assistance to those groups. Um, and, and then that we were taking that time to prepare ourselves to be ready to welcome the cooperatives that were being incubated by 
um, those community-based organizations. So what, that once they were launched, there was a, a home for them. Um, and I think that's a little window into how we got where we are today. Happy to discuss or answer questions. Cool, thank you so much for, for sharing your experiences, Esteban, so much there, um, as always, um, that we can kind of come back to in that open discussion. Um, so yeah, we're gonna pass it over to Amy Hall now. Thanks for joining us, Amy, over to you. Hi everyone, um, thanks a lot. I'm really excited about this event. Um, and yeah, thanks to Carolina and Esteban as well. It's really inspiring to hear what you've got to say and a lot of it really resonated. Um, so a little bit about myself, um, where I'm coming from to this discussion. Um, since December last year, I've been a co-editor at New Internationalist magazine, um, which is a co-op founded in 1973. Um, it's now a multi-stakeholder co-op. Um, so we had a big community share offer where we and we now have 3,600 co-owners um, based around the world. Um, but I've also been part of a lot of local co-op organising where I live in Brighton and Hove over the past seven years or so, um, including several networks of co-ops um, and community-led housing projects. Um, and I'm also a member of Bunker Housing Cooperative, which is um, building houses on council land here in Brighton. Um, and we just completed our first two houses this year. Um, so it's a bit bit of a broad kind of experience in co-ops, but quite localised a lot of the time. Um, and yeah, I think it's important to say that while I've been involved in racial justice organising in a few ways, pretty much all of my co-op focused experience has been in white led or white majority co-ops. Um, so, and I really related to what Esteban was saying about um, people wearing different badges. Um, and uh, yeah, not bringing, it, not bringing their full selves. So I'm, I'm gonna attempt to do that, but it's quite hard to unlearn. <laughs> um, so yeah, a little bit about why I think that co-ops can be an important tool in racial justice work. Um, the current system isn't working for a lot of people, a uh, current way of doing things. Um, poor people, black and brown people, um, uh, the statistics are there when it comes to poverty, access to safe and affordable housing, health outcomes. Um, and, you know, you might say, well, what can we expect from an economic system that was built on colonialism um, and exploitation of a whole range of people around the world? Um, and most co-ops are formed because there is a need that's been identified um, as Carolina was explaining earlier. Um, maybe it's like lack of affordable housing or um, healthy food, that kind of thing. They can be a tool in increasing the power of people over meeting their needs. Um, and um, they can also center racial justice in a, in a system where pe pe these people aren't the priority. Um, Black and brown people have um, the skills, experience and knowledge to make successful co-ops. Um, a lot of people are already working in cooperative ways, um, which I think is important to recognize that just because maybe there aren't that many black and people of color co-ops recorded officially, it doesn't mean that people aren't already used to working in this way. Um, and co cooperatives have the potential to build infrastructure that meets people's needs and works for their benefit. Um, seems like a pretty good combination. Um, there are loads of uh, kind of great projects and organizations kind of linking up economic justice, racial justice with co-ops as part of that in the UK. Um, and if anyone has any examples of people doing this, then do share them because I think it's really important that, that we're all kind of sharing our knowledge um, on this subject because as was mentioned earlier, it's not so well documented here in the UK. Um, land rights um, is, and land justice are one of the things that I'm really passionate about. So I'm really excited about the Black Land and Spatial Justice Project, which was fundraising this summer and has an incredible vision, um, including a Black cooperative move, uh, building the Black cooperative movement in the UK um, and um, acquiring community owned land. Um, on a more local level here in Brighton, um, there's a new co-op a new housing co-op that's been set up called Our Co-op, um, which is um, led by queer people of colour um, for them and their families. Um, and they're really keen to hear from more people who might want to get involved in this kind of project or who are doing similar things elsewhere. And if, if that's you, then let me know and I can put you in touch because they don't have an online presence yet. 
Um, and I also just wanted to mention uh, decolonizing economics, who I know that STIR have worked with a lot. Um, and they're working towards building a new economy movement rooted in racial justice. And um, over the next year, they've been they told me that they've got planned um, collaborative learning program for black, uh, black and people of color on cooperative organizing. Um, they're developing loads of resources and supporting organizations to understand why it's important to invest in um, black and people of color leadership in cooperative development. Um, and they're also really keen to work with people who are, who are interested in these things. So do get in touch with them. Um, so there's a, a really rich and well-documented history of uh, co-ops um, and racial justice work um, in the US. Um, and one of the things that decolonizing economics and other people wanna do is to build a picture of that history in the UK. Um, and um, thanks to Joseph um, for putting in the chat some of the history of credit unions um, in the UK, because I think it's really important um, that uh, we can learn from what's come before us, as well as mapping what is already happening. Um, and yeah, the US does have a different history um, to us, but it, our histories are completely intertwined, like the history of racial justice in the US is completely wrapped up in the history of racial justice in the UK and, and everywhere else. So I think that we, we can learn a lot from the US, but it's really important to recognise what's going on here. Um, and often, um, often that's, you know, not done. Um, so yeah. Um, and I also think it's really important to say that, which kind of what Esteban was talking about, that there, um, that while we might see the co-op sector in the UK as very white dominated, which of course it is, um, that there are loads of um, people of color, um, migrants um, working in the co-op sector in the UK um, who've been doing this work for a long time, um, maybe just as members of individual co-ops kind of in the background. And I think that often, a lot of these people aren't visible or recognized in discussion on race and co-ops or even diversity. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to mention that as well. Um, and yeah, I'd love to see uh, more, um, more of us kind of linking up with each other, I guess, because often you're kind of the only one or one of a handful, um, but um, together, yeah, I think it'd be really exciting to kind of try and build those networks. Um, and yeah, I said, I'd talk a little bit about my experience. Um, and a lot of that has been in, in white majority co-ops um, and spaces um, where um, it can be quite difficult to raise racial justice issues. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about kind of things I've observed, I guess, from my own experience, but also from the experience of others. Um, it can be quite easy to, I think, to become a bit complacent in a co-op because in many ways it's so much better than other businesses, other housing organisations. Um, but just because there's no uh, formal hierarchy um, or um, kind of pay hierarchy, it doesn't mean that they, those hierarchies don't exist. Um, and just because social justice it may be part of your organization's mission, it doesn't mean that you've solved it. Um, and uh, I have to say this because somebody once said it to me, uh, no, an equality and diversity policy is not enough. Um, if someone raising this, raises an issue, please don't say that to them. Um, it can be really easy to brush off or shut down attempts to address imbalances um, um, as a distraction or something that there just isn't time for. Um, and so it's really great that we're having these conversations now because um, I think for a lot of people who have tried to raise these raise these uh, issues and kind of centre racial justice more in people in in work in the past, and um, that's been really hard. Um, and I guess that brings me on to the importance of listening to people when they do raise issues. Um, if someone has, has, is raising an issue around racial justice or, or classism or sexism or all of these things in your organization, um, that wouldn't have been an easy thing to do. Um, and the fact that they've raised that probably means that under, that's like the tip of the iceberg. There's probably other things going on in the background or other experiences that maybe other people who haven't been able to raise them have had. But that doesn't mean that you're terrible people or a terrible organization, you should just throw it all in the bin um, because uh, this is really hard. It's really hard work and we're all part of it. We're all part of this. Um, and yeah, it also takes a long time to sort these things out. So I don't think it's uh, it's nothing, it's something that we're not gonna solve overnight. Um, and yeah, I guess I also really wanted to celebrate the work here of um, the Classwork Project, um, who are a co-op who published the Lumpen Journal 
but they've also been doing some really great work to create spaces uh, for poor and working class people involved in co-ops and social justice movements to center their experiences um, and also to encourage um, kind of owning class people, middle class people to kind of recognize um, the benefits of their class position and um, take steps towards redistribution. Um, and this is really like really, it can be really uncomfortable. Um, I've been part of one of these workshops as a middle class person. Um, and yeah, it is, um, it's hard, um, but it's really important. And I'd love to see um, co-ops and the cooperative sector doing more of this work. Uh, when it comes to racial justice as well um, and linking all of these things together um, just because we're talking about racial justice it doesn't mean that class isn't important but um, it also doesn't mean that you can shut down conversations on race by saying what about this and what about that um, defensiveness doesn't really get us anywhere um, so I think it's really important to like link all these things together and it will make our movement much stronger um, and yeah, I'm just really hoping that we can keep these conversations going um, and continue to um, talk about this beyond this year when it's kind of like seems to be what lots of people want to talk about. Um, and um, yeah, keep listening and uh, supporting each other, sharing resources, sharing knowledge um, for the future. And I'm just yeah, really excited to hear more in the discussion from everyone. Cool. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, and before moving to discussion, just to kind of acknowledge um yeah the kind of emotional labor that it takes to kind of talk about these experiences especially in front of what yeah we probably assume would be a room of majority white people um you know that's something that we've really kind of learned from the work of decolonizing economics um you know what it takes to kind of speak at these kind of events so just want to appreciate and acknowledge that work from our panel this evening um thanks again so we've got you know kind of roughly half an hour um and yeah if we can go to questions now um if you'd like you can put questions in the chat um and i can read some of them out or if you'd like to unmute um or just put in the chat box that you've got a question then i'll invite you to unmute so that 10 people don't unmute at the same time um so yeah if you want to put questions in and just say i've got a question to ask um then i'll hand over to you quickly we've got a question i think for amy um do you have a link for the the Black Land and Spatial Justice work. I'm it in the chat right now. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Cheers for that. And while we're waiting for other questions, we had a question from Veronica for Carolina. Um, she'd like to ask if you can share your experiences and thoughts on women's role in your movement in terms of leadership and structural barriers, as well as skills. Um, I would say that. Um... The, major, the majority of predominantly in the clinics, in cleaning sector, um, cleaning operatives are women. So um, coming together and to look for that parity in, for example, in many of the um, work uh, places that are linked to the union, there is we are looking for this party to have a voice and to make a decision how to campaign and how to protect rights. So it's something that we are facing. Yes, and the um, lack of command of English language is also a barrier for women. But um, at the same time, and just kind of balance it out, um, the information or the data that has been um, collected uh, must, the most up-to-date data for our community um, is leading by the Latin American Women's Rights Services. So there, there is um, an intention to, um, to have um, a voice, yeah, in, in spaces where this um, justice can be reached. As I, as I mentioned in the democratic system and like going to uh, the GLA and things like that. And I think that the main barrier is also um, part of our Latinidad or culture. There's a lot of macho vibes and somehow you have to, to get a bit and um, overcome that to be able to to come together because we acknowledge that we need everyone to to make it this change happen. 
And just to stay with you, Carolina, um, Sean made the point in the comments a little bit earlier about the relationship between the trade union and your cooperative. Um, I think within the UK context, probably with the US too, is that, you know, unions and co-ops as the kind of cousins of the labour movement have kind of historically been separated for different kind of political reasons. Um, and there's been a lot of interest, uh, yeah, in the work between unions and co-ops. Could you speak kind of briefly about, yeah, the relationship between the cleaners and allied workers, independent union and, um, yeah, leading you to set up a co-op? Well, as I mentioned it, um, you know, become a um, political aware um, came from that oppression, really, to feel oppressed by um, layers of oppression, really. So the race, the race, your class, um, your migration status, how uh, defined, definitely is your mi migration status in the UK. So, yes. Um, they they've been some kind of you know cleaning cleaning work hasn't been valued yes but from I would say ten years ago it started to gain more and more recognition and a more recognition through this political awareness yes so the big unions didn't represent the needs uh, of of our community so people step out and say okay we need to do something about that. Let's set up our own unions, right? And from the union movement, uh, no cooperative has came. So if we manage to set our cooperative, it's going to be a milestone and it's going to be a, a response beyond the political awareness to say, okay, we can manage a business. We can do it this way. So I think that's... Um, that's the link between our political awareness, the unionized movement, and then our response to live in this economic uh, era. Cool, thank you so much, Carolina. Um, Amy, would you like to respond to, to Joe's comment, um, which I'll just read out for the benefit of everybody, in case you've missed that. So intersectional repressions are so important here. Thank you for bringing up class, Amy. Black and brown folks are hugely underrepresented and undervalued in co-ops. Working class folks, the same. But it is vanishingly rare that you see black working class folks visibly active in the co-op movement, despite all the experience due to the intersecting oppressions of race and class, not to mention gender and other intersections. Yeah, what Joe said. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, she's totally right. It's the same in media as well, which is kind of an area that I've done some organizing in. Um, it's, yeah, it's rare to see um, non-white people in certain positions. It's rare to see working class people in certain positions. It's even rarer to see a working class women, um, woman in certain positions. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't really know what to say other than I completely agree. And that's why I think um, kind of talking about these issues um, and how they all link to each other is really important. And it's also really important, I guess, um, to see kind of this as more, um, more than, yeah, just a tick box exercise, I guess. So like, for example, if you're thinking about kind of the makeup of co-ops or recruitment or that kind of thing, um, just having some people of color kind of as members doesn't actually necessarily mean, I guess it can go a lot deeper than that basically. So I think that's why it's really important to think about these, these issues and what the barriers are for people and, and they're not gonna be the same for every person of color, like everyone's coming from very different perspectives, very different backgrounds, so yeah. If you're centering a power, a power analysis, then it's, you can't go wrong. Like there's always going to be new things that that are that are being brought to the fore or that are being articulated from people who have a perspective or a vantage point because they've been marginalized by the way that power is flowing. And so for example, you know, even within the movement for black lives, the most recent um, retreat that we had updating our policy platform was when I was invited in along with a few other people. And we were invited in because of the oversights of the first round of leadership. It lacked 
uh, women of color feminism and an analysis of that. Um, it lacked disability justice. It lacked adequate uh, representation and strategies about cooperative economics and what it looked like to build community control. And so those were the people who were invited in to help advise those things. It's, it's more about um, making sure and, and absolutely to the, the points in the chat about um, like what an intersectional power analysis uh, means when you're taking uh, these issues seriously, um, if, if you are constantly questioning and being willing to be questioned about the dynamics of power, not for individuals, right, but like that also, but really power uh, for whole communities of people, which it's not always about how you self-identify or, or, or identities, uh, but it could be from movements, it could be from campaigns, it could be from youth, it could be from whatever, right? Um, that if you are uh, wielding power in such a way that brings humility, um, then, then you'll hear from people, <laughs> right? Sometimes people are not gonna take the time uh, or do the emotional labor of bringing it, knowing that there's gonna be pushback, white fragility, white tears, power plays, backlash, any of that. And so oftentimes people are like, oh, I'm just gonna take my organizing efforts elsewhere. So it really is about making sure that you are um, opening up pathways for the expression of power and being aware that like, the work is not about saying, how do we get different people to the table? It's an, in, it's an inner, inward turn to assess your own power that you take for granted, <laughs> um, your own decisions, leadership, prioritization, all the different ways that power, you know, how, how you are distributing resources. Um, and then figuring out how to share it, how to leverage it, how to distribute it in a way that uh, people who haven't historically had access to power are then able to use it um, for some of these causes or reasons toward these ends. Cool, thank you, Esteban. Um, we have a question for the whole panel around single parenthood in terms of experience around how parents um, could be included in co-ops as the barriers presented by single parenting often means they lack the resources to participate in co-ops without support. Um, yeah, any, any response from the panel? Speak to that question. I'm trying to find where it was again. Uh, the, what about single parenthood? So it's Sarah Louise, um, it's about five questions up. Can any, any of the speakers talk about any experiences they have around how parents, especially single parents, included in co-ops as the barrier presented by single parenting often means they lack the resources to participate in the co-op without support? Yeah, I mean, same thing, right? So the idea of a co-op is that, um, that there is not a long, complicated and bureaucratic chain or power structures to navigate um, between somebody who's experiencing something or has a need or an observation or an idea of how to do things better and somebody else who holds the power to make that change happen, right? That's first and foremost the premise, which means that whether you're a frontline worker, whether you're, you know, that you're able to respond to, be aware of, or take care of the needs of your people. So what does that look like in co-ops? I mean, a ton of our co-ops have single parents. Um, and and uh, to the point about uh, other kinds of marginalized workers, especially like uh, poor and working class workers. I mean, we have a lot of folks who are formerly incarcerated. Um, I'm not exactly sure how that bears out in the UK. In the US, it means you're often unemployable, um, that in some states you don't have the right to vote, you're disenfranchised, right? So what economic democracy looks like is, um, is actually a, a much more powerful value proposition in, in that context. Um, so for single parents, it's, it's like, hey, everyone, we're doing our annual budget, or here's our, our, our operational budget. Here's a thing that I think we need in our workplace. If we're all supposed to go on this retreat, it's not coming out of my pocket to make sure that there's childcare. Like it, in order for me to be there, there needs to be childcare, and that needs to come out of our collective budget um, to provide that, that access. Or um, if, if I am going to be um, doing a job, this is one of the conditions. If we're trying to be accommodating or if we're trying to help 
people who are single parents, then what are the different things that we need? And how does that also shift over time? Like the needs of people who are uh, home with a, an infant or taking care of a baby are really different when you have a sort of daycare age child versus a mm, secondary, I, I don't know I don't know how school works over there. But once they're school aged, let's just say, that's a different um, situation and context and what the needs are, whether that's around scheduling, uh, adaptive technologies, um, stipends. I mean, there's a, there's a whole host of different kinds of considerations. Also, depending on what kind of work you're doing or what kind of job you're 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 doing. I mean, it could be that it's a landscaping company, but you're the bookkeeper and a single parent, and so the things that you would need around that are, are maybe different. And it might just be that you're setting up um, a place for your kid to nap in the office, and that that's cool. Or um, there's a lot of different ways that, that 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 could be handled. I think the important thing is um, is really having a hands-on um, systems management system so that the democratic process is is making it is facilitating um, the 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 workplace culture to meet the needs of your workers regardless of the situation they're in. Yeah, jump, um, Amy. Yeah, so I'm not a parent myself. Uh, just putting that out there, but. Um, in our housing co-op uh, is mostly parents. Um, I think at one point I was the only person that didn't have kids because that was kind of the point of the co-op in the first place. Um, mostly not single parents, but some single parents. Um, and um, I think one of the things that um, we, I've, I've observed, I guess actually more from other organizations is offering, um, if, if possible, if there's the resources, a bit of money towards childcare, but like that the, the but that can be uh, a friend. So like, for example, a friend who maybe could do some extra cash, but who the child knows um, can look after the child. Um, and another thing which I actually um, learned from um, when I was talking to um, Callie um, from Cooperation Jackson, because I was kind of agonizing over this issue of like how to, in our co-op, it's like juggling all the different kids' bedtimes, like trying to do like around all the different bedtimes. Um, and he was saying about how they try and create spaces where kids are always like it's assumed that kids will be there, but it's there's also childcare options. So there's both. So for some parents, they want to be able to bring their kids. But for other parents, they really do not want to bring their kids. Um, and if you can, having those options um, available, I think, is really good and creating a space where kids are welcome. And I don't think that that's always done. Um, and I think it's really hard to do, but it's really important that parents have those options. Yeah and, and, yeah, and just to say, that's reminding me of, of last summer when, when um, the Corporation Jackson were here and um, they started the residential day one of, of three days to say, our children will be here, they'll be moving around, they might be making noises, um, but they're part of this. And it was really, really great to, to see that. Um, yeah, any more questions, if you'd like to put in the chat box, um, that'd be really useful. To come back to you, Amy, um, there's a a kind of few similar questions in the in the chat around you know POC members of COPS in the UK um, and I just wondered if there was anyone in kind of particular that you might want to lift up on the call or kind of mention um, yeah that you know working within the UK that could be supported or lifted up in any way. Uh, I think I mentioned all my favorite all like all, all, all the examples that I could think of um, and yeah I think it's this is like a massive gap in my own knowledge. Um, and I think that people have already shared probably more examples than, than I know of. Um, um, I think in, my, in most co-ops I've come across though, there are like people of color involved um, or a lot of them anyway, not all of them. But, um, but yeah, sorry, I don't really have any other specific examples I can talk about right now. And that's why I, I'm re really excited about this kind of mapping work that people are doing at the moment, because I think it's really, important, especially for those of us outside of major cities. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Do the panelists have any questions to each other on, yeah, on the work that you've heard this evening? I was just, I was just going to lift up and respond to one of the questions in the chat about, uh, about up and go. And, and I know that some of you had a chance to hear from Maru, who's one of our, one of our board members, uh, with the Worker Co-op Federation. Um, so certainly, I think there there's a lot of iteration and ways to learn. Um, I think uh, we're still learning the ways in which, especially with platforms and, and technology, 
um, the ways in which it can be a little more complex than it seems at first to sort of pick up and adapt um, a particular platform uh, overseas or in another context. So that's something to, to look out for, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't mean that there can't be lessons and, and, and iterations um, to learn from that. So um, yeah, thanks for that question. And then the other question in the chat about transnational cooperativism and uh, opportunities and connections for global justice. I would say the same thing I was saying about racial justice, which is, right, it's not that cooperatives need to like define a whole agenda and set up a whole campaign. It's like, there's already an agenda. There are already movements for global justice. There's already uh, international mutualist and transnational movements. Like pick one, fit, figure out the one that's aligned with you um, and your politics and then get into it. Certainly we have an, an obligation to move forward the agendas that, that um, the international and multilateral agendas um, that have been proposed within the cooperative space. And I know that um, whether it's the sustainable development goals that ICA is working on the International Cooperative Alliance, um, or more recently the move toward, I think it actually came from some of the credit union sector in the US, but but the move toward adopting um, principles around equity or diversity inclusion, um, either as an eighth cooperative principle internationally or as um, an additional interpretation of the existing cooperative principles whatever that distinction is um, within the within ICA leading up to to the postponed general assembly um, those are things that we we need to mobilize our own delegates within our home countries to make sure that they come down on the right side of that that they vote in support of it so there are definitely things that we can be accountable within the co-op sector of moving forward but otherwise if we're talking about you know um, climate justice movements migrant justice i mean all of these groups have already they're very clear about like what it looks like to stand up against islamophobia to stand um in solidarity with with working people um in a lot of different contexts i think it's more remembering that cooperatives are a powerful tool and so when we see movements that we are in alignment with that we're in a solidarity with it's incumbent on us to turn to them and say how can we help and what is it about our tool for economic wealth building um, and uh, and economic democracy for you know power and voice? What is it that we can do that's going to be helpful? Um, including here's our model. You're working with refugees; those people need jobs. Here's our model that can then be helpful for them. You know, you're working with people who women who are experiencing domestic violence. Here's our model. This gives them the economic tools to be uh, autonomous and escape. Um, an unsafe or abusive situation and have the, right? So whatever those things are, this is just for having the humility to remember cooperatives are not a movement into themselves. It's a form that of organizing uh, resources and labor um, and, you know, toward an ends, which is ultimately about people in some form. Um, and so how do we bring that tool to bear in some of these um, conversations? Cool, thank you, Esteban. Amy, were you ready to jump in with a question to, to one of your panelists? Or should we go to another question? Um, yeah, I was gonna ask Carolina actually, um, if um, there are, if you've had met much contact with any other co-ops around the UK um, who are also cleaners or doing similar kinds of things. And thanks for your question, Amy. Uh, yes, we are in contact and we are now supported by the Belfast Cleaning Society, which is a cooperative. And we have received a lot of insights from the, um, the journey. So from the inception to now um, 10 years of operation. Um, so, and actually we came, um, we came across the hive uh, through another ener community energy cooperative in, in London. So for us, it's been, um, it's, we are grateful and for this um, exercise of solidarity and the, the cooperative principles that to support others when they are started. And thank you, Esteban, for your, um, your words and it inspires me um, just to see uh, the work ahead of us to 
still um, questioning uh, ourselves, our oppressions, and thing will be. It, it is um, it is inspiring. And thank you, Amy, also for the organizations that you mentioned. I just checked them online, and they see, they look amazing. So thank you very much. Thank you, Carolina. I think it's it's really interesting because um, Esteban was kind of. And Caroline was talking about how kind of political awareness can lead to co-ops and in the work of the Centre for Family um, Life in New York, Mary Batista, who, who Esteban mentioned was a board member of the US Federation of Worker Co-ops. In her work, she also talks about the migrants she works with being politicised by joining the worker co-op development programmes and then joining protests and, and local actions. So it's kind of really interesting in terms of yeah, people being politicised and finding their way there and then being politicised by virtue of, of joining a co-op and kind of understanding, you know, the role of kind of political autonomy and independence and security and a range of things that we see that co-ops can offer to a range of different problems. Um, we've got 10 minutes left. Have we got any more questions? Does anybody want to unmute and, and jump on and, and ask a question? I do, but I've already spoken a bunch. Um, so maybe, maybe I'll ask my question and if, if a participant has a question, we'll let them jump stack. I'm just curious uh, on your side, speaking of transatlantic um, connections, on your, on your side, what are some of the demands that you're hearing from movements, um, from organizers who are, um, who are working on racial justice issues in the UK and how are you imagining cooperatives can, can show up um, for those movements and, and be a solution for some of those problems? Would anybody like to step in or, or, or like Amy says, leave a comment, leave a, leave a note in the chat box? Um, I mean, quickly, we've been working with Amar Deep Dillon, who also joined the festival, um, and he's he's doing a quarterly column in our in our magazine, um, and he's been writing a lot about the relationship between the mutual aid groups and co-ops, and he's he's been writing for us. He's just in our, our new publication, which we released last week. Um, you know, taking a really critical stance of the co-op sector in the UK, saying that it's simply not ready to support and, and you know, aware of that relationship. Um, so that's been, I think that's one of the main kind of connections around, you know, kind of social justice and the mutual aid organizing um, during the pandemic. Sean put his hand up. Yeah, I, I just responding to Esteban, I mean, I really think that the UK movement is totally stuck still in the problem that you identified, which is that the leadership or the main organisations that are there to promote cooperation in the UK just just propose, oh, well, you know, the, the answer to everything is cooperatives. And I think this orientation towards the actual existing social movements is lacking. It's certainly some that's the orientation of my work now is entirely towards that is look out there, look at what people are doing already, how people are organising to try and meet needs and try and further political struggles. And then we show up and we say, we've got this, we've got these things, which you might be interested in because, because they can enable you to move directly into the economic sphere to supplement your struggle on the streets and your struggle through unions or your struggles in other ways. And they may be useful. There may be an opportunity to use them. And, and if you think you can use them, maybe we can, we can offer something. And that's a very different approach to cooperative development than we're used to in the UK. The UK is way behind you on this, it, way behind you on this. The worker co-op sector is, is starting to sort of wake up to it, but um, I'm afraid it's, it's, uh, it's early days for this, for this orientation, which I completely agree with. Well, and I saw your hand, Amy. Yeah, just, um, yeah, in response to what Esteban was asking about as well. In terms of like land and housing, I think um, what a lot of people are, are asking for is, is redistribution um, in, of land um, 
and of, of housing and kind of that not to be done in a way that's like, we well, can borrow this for a bit, um, but we want to take it back kind of whenever we feel like it um, so that people can really build kind of really long term projects um, and long term cooperatives. Um, because, yeah, it can be really hard to organise in that way otherwise. Um, so that's what I've been hearing a lot of in kind of discussions around land and housing co-ops and other types of, uh, of organisations. Um, Cool, thank you, Amy. Um, would anybody else like to jump in? Got about five minutes left. I also don't want to misrepresent the US. I mean, I'm purely talking about the worker co-op sector, <laughs> right? Because believe me, the UK generally is far, far, far ahead of many of the cooperative sectors in the US that, um, that are wow, they're, uh, they're not even pretending to say the right things. <laughs> they certainly wouldn't even have had a, a tweet like that in some of the farmer co-ops, some of the rural electric co-ops. They're getting better. They are getting better, but it's um, they're not listening to any of the stories, perspectives, or advice that I've even had the opportunity to share with you today. Um, it's just starting to like reorient with some of the leadership of the National Cooperative Business Association in the US. Um, and and I've had to be part of that literally as a board member for like eight years to get that to start slowly turning around um, and having people like Jessica gordon Emhard, you know, constantly coming back as speakers at the conferences and, and things like that. So uh, this is not at all to be like, look at what a great job we've done. It's, it's the difference of, you know, um, different, uh, organizing spaces and, and sectors. And, and if that is helpful, I think it's important to just start by biting off um, manageable chunks that might be a sector strategy, that might be generational, like working with youth and being like, you know what? A lot of people are about to retire in the UK, um, including in the co-op sector. Let's just work on the youth and we're gonna be fine. We don't need to tell them about uh, sexism and racial justice, like they already get it. Um, but what they do need is mentorship to, to come into the cooperative field and, and see what's promising about this as a 21st century solution to a lot of the different kinds of um, economic promises, uh, problems we're gonna be facing. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just checking to see if we've got any more. Um, Stephanie Bolt saying we're about to embark on testing models for a worker film co-op for young POC and marginalised filmmakers based in Cardiff working with colleagues who have experienced the complete wall in front of young people of colour and from low socioeconomic back backgrounds. Please share any reference points, CEO at Living Poly on Twitter. Um, and obviously, yeah, young people is a really important point to make. Esteban um, and Stephanie in terms of 18 to 24 year olds being the most likely to lose work as a result of the pandemic and with the furlough ending in the UK last weekend, something like a million young people who are not learning or earning within the economy. Um, and that fallout over the next couple of years um, is gonna be a really important part of cult development. And as Esteban um, says, um, all of these issues around oppression are far more intuitive to young people today um, and introducing cults as a tool um, as part of that response as a single way of responding to, yeah, particular issues there. Um, yeah, it's going to be really, really, really important. Cool. So if the, nobody else has got another question, I'm going to thank the panel because it's nearly nine o'clock in the UK. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for everybody's time this evening. Thank you for joining us, spending the last hour and a half together. Um, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to Carolina Rodriguez, Esteban Kelly, Amy Hall and Sean Wellens. Um, thank you to Teddy Reese, who's on our team, who's been supporting the, the tech today. Thank you again, Teddy, because um, we've had two webinars today. So Teddy's been, been the digital host of Intersectional Economics this afternoon, um, and then again tonight. Um, so thanks for, for your support tonight. My pleasure. Um, cheers, Teddy. Um, we will follow, send a follow-up email. Um, before I sign off from here, if you want to drop in any particular requests for resources or contacts, then please do. And I'll download the transcript, check that, and we can try and respond as best as we possibly can. Um, but thank you again for everybody for, for their contribution. Like Sean says, it's kind of 
early days, there's lots of work and it will be slow and patient. Um, but I think there's a kind of, yeah, some really exciting work to do around this. Um, and there's many people that have taken a, yeah, have taken an interest in how co-ops can be embedded within their work um, around different forms of political organizing. So thank you to everybody. Goodbye from me. Um, thanks again. And yeah, see you on a, another webinar soon. Take care.